So uh, welcome everybody, and uh, I am going to introduce the artist, Rob Shetterly, the artist of Americans Who Tell the Truth. <laughs> So this is, this is great. I've never been introduced by a portrait subject before. <laughs> and also, as you will see shortly, I have never, he's the only person I've ever painted who I left him, him wearing the same clothes that he showed up in. <laughs> I always change the colors. I always rearrange things and do all sorts of stuff with the clothing uh, when nobody's looking. And, uh, but Doug, that works so well well, I haven't changed this since the first <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> So he's wearing the same thing. So I want to just, for the, the sake of people who don't know this, about this project or much about it, some of you have heard probably too much about it, just tell you a little bit about the background here. This, I began painting these portraits in January of 2002 in response to already more than a year of the propaganda and lies that were leading us to the Iraq war. I was just overwhelmed with my own anger, grief, and uh, alienation from this country. And I thought, what can I do with this at this moment besides leave the country? You know, how can I take all this enormous negative energy that I'm feeling and turn it, turn it to use, do something positive, which I felt I had to do because all the negative, negativity was actually killing me. I could feel that I was not healthy any longer. And I was driving everybody around me crazy with all the ranting I was doing. Uh, Gail will attest to that. She's standing there in the back. <laughs> so uh, what I, I'll, I'll try to talk louder. Uh, so what I did was I said, well, I'll just, what I'll do is begin to surround myself with Americans who make me feel good about this country rather than rant about Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, you know, one more day. And that's where it started. I went out and painted a portrait of, of Walt Whitman. Uncle Walt saved my life, as a matter of fact. You know, he, he explained to me what little d democracy means, that every living thing, not just every person, is created equal, and we must protect the life of every living thing if we want to flourish on this earth. And everything then else will flourish too. And I thought at one moment that that would be the only portrait I would paint. And two or three days later, I was ranting once again, and Gail said to me, paint another portrait. <laughs> you were such a nice guy for two days. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what happened. I looked at her, and this, this, an epiphany happened. I said, I'm going to paint 50 portraits. I had never painted a portrait before. I mean, I was a self-taught artist, but I'd never painted a realistic portrait. I said to her, I'm going to paint 50 portraits. I'm going to call them Americans Who Tell the Truth. And then I'm going to give them all away. And uh, that sounded great. I like, it was like I levitated to say I was going to do something that was totally non-commercial for some extended period of time. Uh, that was not exactly the same as uh, uh, that popular with everybody in the household. We've been living on art. But I was not going to sell these paintings because the people in the paintings, even though I hadn't painted them yet, never have been uh, given anything for the work they've done for this country, to try to close that gap between what we say as a country and what we actually do. And so there are now almost 280 of these portraits. They travel to schools, colleges, museums, libraries, pizza parlors, movie theaters. Uh, we consider this democratic art. We don't want it to be in elite museums. We want it to be where people are. And that's where it goes, to where people are. I was just in Virginia all last week, and someone was in, uh, it was a big show at uh, James Madison University where they're actually teaching a social justice course using the portraits. And then I was at the, the senior center in Charlottesville where hundreds and hundreds of people were coming, and it was all directed towards those people and uh, with terrific audiences. And it was just great, you know. So on one hand, we had all these kids, and the other hand, we had all these older people, people my age. So, uh, when I first started painting, it was all 19th century figures. I mean, I, after Walt Whitman, I painted Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, you know, Jane Addams, Mother Jones, you know, all these people, icons. Uh, at the same time, for the first time in my life, I was reading their biographies and finding out who these people really were, you know, not just as 
people who did these iconish things in our history, but who also were flawed human beings, just like all the rest of us. And that has turned out to be the really good news. Because now, most of the portraits I paid are people that most of us don't know. They aren't pedestalized people. They're people who have, you know, in some community or maybe on a larger or smaller scale, have acted with courage to create more social justice in their communities or in the country or in the world. And I find you know, and that's what I want this project to be. It's not about superheroes. It's about all of us, any one of us, who in a moment can act with courage to make things different for other people. So, and I brought, uh, in the context of, of Doug, uh, I brought a couple of other portraits of, of, uh, of people that are, you know, in his community. Um, one is, you know, uh, <clears throat> Daniel Ellsberg. I mean, you all know Daniel Ellsberg. He just died this year. Um, you know, one of the iconic, I mean, he is an iconic figure of the anti-war and peace and justice movement. You know, a man who, you know, was on the inside and realized he couldn't live with himself on the inside and had to tell the truth about what was really going on and what the government was actually doing about Vietnam. And told that story expecting that he would spend the rest of his life in jail. Um, and then instead, contributed enormously to ending the Vietnam War. This woman, most of you probably don't know, uh, Chanapa Kambangsa is a Laotian American whose family fled Laos when the U.S. was bombing that country. You know, during Vietnam, the U.S. also bombed Laos and Cambodia. Just in Laos, they dropped more bombs that were dropped in World War II, and nobody knows much about that. And I just want to read the quote that's on her painting, because this is so important about what we do and we don't know about. It says, the US dropped 20, 260 million cluster bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War. That was in the Plain of Jars in the north of, of, uh, of Laos where they thought the Viet, uh, the, the Viet Cong were, or the North Vietnamese were using the Ho Chi Minh Trail to get into, into South Vietnam. That's where they kept bombing. And they bombed you know, all the peasants who lived there. People lived in caves and in holes. Nobody could escape what was happening. The U.S. dropped 260 million cluster bombs. I'll shout it. 260 cluster bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War. An estimated 80 million did not detonate, scattering throughout Lao villages, rice fields, schoolyards, pasture lands, and forests. The equivalent of a plane load of bombs was dropped every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for nine years, more per capita than any other country in the world. This is called the secret war. The mission of Legacies of War, that's the project that she started, is to advocate for the uh, clearance of unexploded bombs and provide space for healing the physical and emotional wounds, wounds of the war. So it's been... Uh, my uh, great honor and privilege to meet people like this, to you know, paint their portraits and try to you know, spread the word about what, 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 they, what that true history is and what still is to be done. This woman over here, Ann Wright, maybe some of you even know her, uh, she was a colonel in the US Army and a diplomat at the start of the Iraq War. And, we, and the day it started, she resigned, saying and said this, I have served my country for almost 30 years in some of the most isolated and dangerous parts of the world. I want to continue to serve America. However, I do not believe in the policies of this administration and cannot morally or professionally defend or implement them. It is with heavy heart that I must end my service to America and therefore resign. <coughs> Since then, she has become one of the most activist activists in, the, in, this, in this country. She is everywhere. Any cause, she will show up and, and, and work on it. And, you know, currently, I know recently, she's been on several flotillas trying to get uh, aid to Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, been frustrated a couple of times in, in, by that and attacked. Uh, and the, some of the ships that she was on that were bringing aid were attacked and shot at, and people were killed on those boats as they were trying to bring aid. So, uh, Anyway, there are 280 stories like this, 
But uh, what I want to do is, I just wanted to give a context for Doug Rawlings and why I painted him. The only question I don't know is why I waited this long to paint him. Uh, except that I, it sometimes makes... He gets better looking every day, that's he, why. He <laughs> I don't know if I made him better looking. Hey, I'll in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of you know Doug. You know, he's one of the original founders in 1985 of Veterans for Peace. Uh, he's a veteran of Vietnam. He's an extraordinary poet, uh, a man who's the president of the main chapter of Veterans for Peace. Uh, he's been doing in incredible work all this time. And I have, you know, both, I admire him enormously as a friend, but also for the work he does. It's just, uh, you know, probably the strongest voice we have against war these days is from, uh, you know, veterans like Doug. And Doug keeps this organization going and keeps that voice alive. It is so incredibly important, especially with the, you know, the level of control, not only from our political side, but from our media. Everybody, you know, enhancing and, and reiterating all this militarism as though it's a good thing and somehow, somehow that we are, you know, there's some redemptive value in militarism, whereas there is no redemptive value. It's all negative value. And uh, anyway, it gives me enormous pleasure. But I, I want to say something. Uh, there's a, the quote. The quote that's on his portrait um, is really, I'm trying to find glasses. I have them. Oh. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They probably weren't strong enough. <laughs> By the way, this book, I wish I had painted Doug sooner because his portrait would have been in this book. This, this, this book, Portraits of Peacemakers, comes out on October 8th, and we're doing an event in Blue Hill on October 9th to launch the book. We're bringing one of the portrait subjects, uh, John Hunter, who teaches the fourth grade world peace game in Charlottesville, here to be on stage and talk about his work and then the importance of educating young people as peacemakers rather than you know, soldiers. And um, anyway, the, the, one of the uh, essays in here, in fact, my own essay, uh, <laughs> begins with a quote from Mary Oliver. And I was, as I was thinking about Doug's quote, I thought, you know, this is so similar. She just puts the same thought a different way. So I'm gonna read Mary Oliver's quote and then we're going to unveil this portrait, and Doug will read his quote. But she says, you must not ever give anyone else the responsibility for your life. You must not ever give anyone else the responsibility for your life. So he hasn't seen this. <laughs> <laughs> This is a terrible part for me. I hate this part. <laughs> you ready? No. There you go. Oh. <laughs> you, want to, you want to come over, over here and read that? <laughs> so what did he say? He said, I was drafted in 1968, and after 16 weeks of so-called training, I was shipped, shipped out for Vietnam. I felt like a piece of meat to be used by others to achieve their ends. I don't remember anyone asking my permission to use me. I don't. For Jack. I'm, okay, so it's me now, huh? Oh boy. <laughs> if I were smart, I'd just stop right now and shut up. But I'm not. The reason I brought these other portraits is so you wouldn't think that I only paint people who look like me. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate compliment. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, all right. I've got a, I have some po a couple poems to read. I have, I'm not going to read all of this stuff. I have you no more than 15 minutes, right? No more. If I can, if I can pull that off. Um, so, all right. Yes, I, I was in fact drafted, et cetera, et cetera. We formed Veterans for Peace in 1985, as, as, as Rob said. Here in Maine, five of us, we had no idea that we were going to turn into an organization that eventually had 130 chapters all across the United States, 
five international chapters, NGO status at the United Nations, and access to a number of different political events. Our first field trip, if you will, from Maine, it started here in Maine, right? And we, our national office was in Portland for a little bit, then it went to Washington, D.C., then it got too expensive in D.C., and so we went to St. Louis, Missouri. So our national office is in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, our first field trip, if you will, from Maine was to come support in 1986 five members who were on a 40-day water-only fast in front of the Capitol building, protesting the wars in Central America. Of those people were people like George Mizo, Vietnam veteran who formed Friendship Village in Vietnam, working with Vietnamese people who are still suffering from Agent Orange, exposure to Agent Orange. He went over there, started this whole thing. It's still going, okay? He was one of the people. Another people's person was Brian Wilson, who, uh, after this, unfortunately lost both his legs as he was sitting in, on a railroad track trying to stop a munitions train from going to Central America. He was run over by that train. He's still with us. He's a very strong member of Veterans for Peace. And another member was Charlie Litke. Charlie was a chaplain in Vietnam who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for saving 20 lives or so one day under heavy fire, wounded himself. He's the only person in the history of the United States to turn in this Congressional Medal of Honor in protest against our wars in Central America. So that's a tenor of the people in Veterans for Peace. Another person I'd like to mention is Susan Schnall, who is our current president. She goes back and forth from San Francisco to New York City and whatever. Uh, she was in the uh, Army uh, as a captain, was a nurse, and in 1968 led anti-war protests against the war, anti-war against the war. There we go, okay, that's my first major mistake. No. It's that, and she said, you know, if General Westmoreland can walk in his uniform in favor of this war, I can walk in my uniform against it. She was court-martialed. She faced five years in jail. She got out of all of that. She is now a strong, strong member of Veterans for Peace. So um, my coin, if you will, of trying to express what's actually going on in my head is poetry. Um, and so I've written a, a number of books of poems and whatnot. Um, and I just want to read a few of them to you today. Um, very quickly, I write very short poems. <laughs> honest, honest. Uh, here's one I wrote at, at, at the beginning of the whole military experience. It's entitled, uh, Leaving the Induction Center. Okay? We're now all riders on those olive drab government buses, trying to make some sense out of this thing they called military justice. Still a bunch of miners digging about in our own little ruins, burrowing through the dangerous trash of our own silly illusions. We're all of us, just drifters, caught up in a dirty little war, left to ride it out alone on our own thin little prayers. So I was drafted out of graduate school in 1968. Um, and back then, of course, 68, 69, in that period of time, the Vietnam War was when all hell broke loose, if you will. And all those little lies they were telling the American public about, we're winning this war, there's light at the end of the tunnel, all that kind of stuff is turning out to be garbage. And so they were grabbing anybody that could move, including me, right? Uh, and so very quickly, I, went, I was drafted out of graduate school. I remember clearly that day being in a boarding house at Ohio State University, opening up a letter that said, greetings, Douglas. <laughs> Only my mother called me Douglas. Greetings, Douglas. You are to report to Buffalo, New York, on January 9th, 1969, for induction into the military service. Whoa, me? What? They grabbed this, et cetera, et cetera. Basic training, AIT at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in artillery. A three-week leave in Nam. okay? And I went over by myself, okay? We didn't go over in units. So when I landed at Tonsonute Air Force Base in, in Vietnam, I didn't know anybody, okay? And, the, you know, and those sergeants that were there trying to get us off of that plane. You gotta understand, this plane landed at night. There were no lights. Doors opened up and they started yelling their usual profanities, which I won't share with you. But getting off that plane, and there's these guys that were in Nam for a year getting ready to get back on that plane. And they're looking at us and we're looking at them going, oh, what the hell? Um, so anyways, um, that's how it started. I spent 13 and a half months in Vietnam with an artillery base in the Central Highlands. We were supporting the 173rd Airborne. And when Rob was reading this, that's what we did. 
right? 175s and 8 inch howitzers, they were powerful, powerful weapons, and we bombed the hell out of those countries. So I, when I came back, um, this is a poem about coming back, and it's entitled On Being Invisible. I was really careful about not saying on being invinci invincible, on being invisible. Um, and it's got a, a little quote from Wallace Stevens' poem in it, oh, it's a snowman. So, on being invisible. So you come home from a war alone, and within a week, the first place you want to be is in the bleachers of Fenway Park. One of many who, where no one knows who you were last week with your freaked out sense of mortality. Incoming, you caught out in the open last day in country, burying your face in the mud, becoming the mud. Please, dear God, please make me disappear and not be me, and I'll never, ever, ever want to be anything more ever again. I'm looking to be as diaphanous as the deer by the apple tree lost in the morning mist. Here today, gone tomorrow, nothing more, nothing less. Just let me come home and rest in the bosom of Wallace Stevens. For the listener who listens in the snow, and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there in the nothing that is. Amen, brothers and sisters, amen. We just wanted to come back into our lives. We didn't want parades, we didn't want any other crap. We just wanted to see if we could somehow figure out how to exist in this culture again. Of course, finding out that things have changed drastically, not here in America over the 13 and a half months, but also within myself. So uh, I'll finish my little personal thing here, uh, reading a poem that I, I wrote after last year, when uh, uh, in August of 2023, I went back to Vietnam I went with my son, Josh, who's over here. Uh, I went back and I swore I would never go back to Vietnam as a tourist. I did not want to be a tourist. I was invited to present on a panel in a, a, a conference presented by the Vietnamese people called Our Cultural Heritage. It was our 19th annual, 500 Vietnamese scholars, teachers, students were talking about their heritage. And I joined a panel where we were to discuss about the GI resistance to the war. I was stunned that many of the Vietnamese did not know there were veterans and GIs who were opposed to the war, including why we were actually in country. So I was part of that whole thing. Um, and then I did my presentation with this, with this wonderful woman who's the director of the War Remnants Museum, uh, and she translated my poems into Vietnamese as I read them in, in English. <laughs> and then she looked at me a little bit later on and she said, you know, we never, we forgive, but we never forget. Whoa, that's what I encountered in Vietnam. Uh, and then my friend Chuck Searcy, who's been there for 35 years, and if you're a devout reader of the New York Times, about a month and a half ago, they did a full-page story on Chuck Searcy. He went back to Vietnam. He's a non-vet. He went back to start what they call Project Renew, which is the project with Americans helping Vietnamese, Americans and French, by the way, helping Vietnamese remove unexploded ordnance from their rice paddies. Fifty years later, they're still maiming children, women, kids. I went to their actual offices and saw the prosthetic lab they had there, putting together arms and legs for kids with still getting stuff blown off. So I went with Chuck uh, around the DMZ for five days. Josh and I did. It was an amazing experience. We went to Quezon, we went to Da Nang, we went to all these places uh, and actually went through these actual tunnels where the Vietnamese people stayed. And we were, we were brought around by a Vietnamese guy, right? And they were told us, and, and you know, he spoke a little English, not much. I speak no Vietnamese, of course. And, and he took us to these tunnels and he said, see, see? And we went into these tunnels. We live here for months, months. You bomb us. We live here. And there were these teeny little tunnels. Just little, ah, it was staggering. So um, here's a poem I wrote called uh, Vietnam Redo, going back. Um, I look twice, now where I used to look only once, like where routes two and four merge with route 156. Or when my imagination takes me to a little village just on the other side of the river Styx, where there truly was hell to pay those many years ago across that river and up and down those swirling tides. Where, where Beelzebub got to play with his gift box of G.I. Joes as we desperately hung on for his satanic little ride. I went back to that land of my 50-year-old dreams, thinking I'd finally put some nightmares out to pasture, hoping to quiet down those monosan beetle-mouth screams, looking for that proverbial sense of closure. 
But who am I to expect more from this madly tortured land that once swallowed up my illusions of masculine grandeur and spat out a soldier boy who tried to become a man only to become a tool of that mindless, endless slaughter? So I went back thinking maybe I could have some resolution and stuff like that. I did get some resolution. I did become a tourist too, by the way. A little, you know, I just couldn't help but being one. And I, I, I resolved something from it, but I looked at these Vietnamese people and they were so incredibly gracious and so wonderful. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get rid of it. So um, anyways, I'm here today uh, because of, uh, I think I, I'd like to read three, three quick poems for the people who made it possible for me to be even standing here, okay, and surviving over these years. One is a woman whom I dated when I was in college, uh, and then we broke up, and I got drafted and went into the Army, and she went to uh, Philadelphia to work as a nutritionist, okay? And so as my year progressed in Vietnam, I started writing her letters back and forth, and we corresponded, and as it got close to when I left, which was in August of 1970, um, I wrote to her and I said, hey, you want to meet me in San Francisco? And she said, sure. Imagine that. Now, she hardly knew me, right? I've been in Nam. And back then, you know, everybody would tell you about, you know, Nam vets going, you know, ballistic and all that kind of stuff. She agreed to meet me in, in San Francisco. So we met in San Francisco and we took a bus down to Los Angeles. And on the way down to Los Angeles, we decided that we would hitchhike across the country. So we took about three weeks went down to Mexico, across the states, and all that kind of stuff. And I like to say, as a parent now, now I realize what I must have done to my parents. So I got out of Nam, no cell phones, nothing. We're on the road. See ya when I get there. Who knows? So um, I write this poem for her. Uh, we, and, and by the way, so after that, we moved to Boston, then we moved to Seattle, we moved to Boston, we moved to Maine. We got married. We've been married 53 years now. Uh, and uh, here's a poem. Yes. <laughs> for better or for worse, right? Here's a poem entitled Survivor's Manual for Judy. If your arms and legs are still intact, you are a survivor. If tall meadow grasses still delight you with their sudden pheasants, you are a survivor. If the faces of passing children remain the faces of passing children, you are a survivor. If your nightmares will wait for the night, you are a survivor. If you can find your way back into someone's love, you, my friend, are a survivor. So I got there. So in 1974, coming and doing quick math, I'll say, hey, that was 50 years ago. My daughter was born. <laughs> She's over here. <laughs> she became that second person to help me become who I am. In this poem I wrote, uh, we had friends who lived up around Rangeley Lake, and, and we're, they had a beautiful house right on the lake. And one morning, she's two years old, I've got her in my arms. And I'm standing out on the deck, looking out at the vast expanse, looking for some kind of universal truths or something. And I hear a giggle. And I look down, and she's looking at this birch tree, which is about a foot away from where we were, a little flapping in the breeze. And I said, oh, lesson number one from my little daughter. Pay attention <laughs> to what's in front of you. So this is a poem for Jen. And by the way, Jen is now, um, as a quick math tells you, 50 years old. She's right over there. Uh, and <laughs> And she's, and, she's, and she's become a teacher of English as a second language, and she's working with immigrants and working on behalf of immigrants and doing this amazing work. So, yes. <laughs> Here's a poem for Jen. The birch splits its bark, the snake its skin, the child leaps into the woman she always has been. Nothing is new, nothing is changing. The birch is the bark, the snake, the skin, the child, the woman. The seed flowering dies back into the earth as the child growing turns forward toward her new birth. And I've been blessed seeing this birth again and again and again and again. She's also the mother of two amazing, grand, like two, my, two amazing granddaughters who are also here who are gonna make the world a better place for sure. Then a couple of years later, my son is born, all right? Uh, and uh, became a chemical engineer. He, uh, he has a passion for snowboarding. He's been all over the world, Greenland, Newfoundland, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera, working in, in building timber frame homes now, these amazing houses for people. And he works in a, in a business in, in Vermont. 
uh, as a people person, helping everybody figure out how to live a better life in these beautiful houses. Um, I wrote this poem for, her, for him when he was turning 13. At the time, I was reading some work by Margaret Mead uh, and her work in New Guinea. Uh, and she wrote about a right that she witnessed where men would grab these boys who were about the age of 13 or so, grab these boys from the village and tear them out of the village. And the women would scream and yell, what are you doing? And they would bring these boys into the jungle and sit down in a circle. And the men would then cut their and bleed into a gourd and give the gourd to the boy and say, drink this. The boy drank this and they said to him, you are now a man. There's nothing in our culture that's the equivalent of that, except what used to be in our culture was the whole notion of uh, joining the military. So I wrote this poem entitled Giving Silence for my son Josh and his best friend David turning 13. If Nam vets were ancient shamans, now would be the moment we choose to give you shelter from the coming storm. But we are merely survivors of suburbs and cities, not forest nor mountain. Modern men offering you our silences, our words, to guide you going out on your own. Yet we have known for years now that the silences of our fathers will not do. And we have known that, that words alone cannot bleed you free of your raging doubts. So listen up to what we have found between silences and words. Open up your fists. Watch women move. Scorn uniforms. Don't march. Dance. You know, and, and what I like to say, what, what I like to say, watch women move. I'm, I'm not trying. I'm not being sexist. I'm talking to a young boy and say, there's a certain grace that women have about movement. Sorry, guys. Certain grace about <laughs> movement. That, you know, it's just so. Just watch. Watch what happens. Um, okay. So this last poem I wrote um, for a remarkable human being who has been a guiding life in the later part of my lives. Uh, we were both born in the same year, 1946 when I succumbed to the draft and ended up in Vietnam, this man chose a different path. He publicly turned in his draft card in 1970 to William Sloan Coffin and courageously took a public stance against the war. This display of moral courage should not be underestimated for he's faced five years in jail and a hefty fine for doing that. He was not like a, tr a draft dodger uh, claiming to have <coughs> bone spurs you know, so he could get out of the war and follow his own self-indulgent life. No, he was taking a public stance against the war. And, and when, trust me, when I was in Vietnam, those were the guys we were looking towards, men and women, who were trying to end this freaking war to get us home. All right, the Hawks, I, I hated those guys because they kept on saying, oh, we're winning. We're not winning, you know, and give me, a, and, and, and define winning, by the way. You know, and, if, and one of the little historical moment is prior to the Vietnam War, Winning in a military engagement was essentially taking over real estate, right? Took over that town, took over this next town, took over this next town. In Vietnam, that wasn't working. It was guerrilla warfare. We were surrounded by the, by the VC, Viet Cong, the NFL. What do you want to call them? NLF. NLF. <laughs> Not the NFL. That, that's, that's later in my life. The, N, the NLF. We were, surround, we were surrounded by these people. And so they had to redefine what victory meant. And they came up with the body count. We kill more of them and they kill of us, we win, right? And that has become that sort of the, the formula, if you will. It started with that. And we were looking at that. I was getting very close to some of the villagers that we were close to in the Central Highlands, thinking, this is the enemy. These little kids who are trying, selling us dope and prostitutes, that's the enemy. Uh, so anyways, um, I would like to uh, take this moment, if you will, and recognize this individual who happens to be with us right now. And his name is Rob Shutterly. And um, God, if you would bring this, uh, I think I think it's I think it's time to do another unveiling. Congratulations, congratulations, Doug. Much deserved. Thanks, man. And ready, God had right an amazing it. number of veterans. There, there's one. Come over here, Rob. Would you please? This is a uh, an unveiling of a. Uh, portrait, if you will. I'm not a portrait artist. I'm a, I write poetry. So, if you will, this is a poem oh my God. superimposed on two pictures. Oops. <laughs> two pictures of Rob and I in 1970. Now, if you can't see those things because they're so... You know, wow. So, 
This that's is this, me. That's this guy. <laughs> that's me. I'm in Nam. He's against fighting against the war. This is so I wrote this poem entitled A Poem for Rob, an American in 1969. I'm told the truth. There are two men standing on either side of this portrait, one being the artist, activist, the other being the mere subject. One being a man of conviction, willing to sacrifice his life for others. The other a tool of war, sent out to kill his sisters and brothers. So which one should be thanked for his service these 55 years later? The creator or the slayer? The maker or the taker? The healer or the breaker? I'm betting on the artist activist whose work still stands the test of time for having chosen the right path in 1969 when so many lives were on the line. As for the other player in this moment of unveiling, as an American struggling to tell the truth, let's just say he's got a long way to go before his labors can bear the same sweet fruit. Thank you all for being here. It's been a real honor. And uh, let's, and we'll go in peace. <laughs>